episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the third installment of Land Before Time Reviews. So far, we've seen me grow a fondness for the original, suffered a bit through 4, embraced the epicness of 7, and finished out with 8. It's been a very interesting bunch of movies with their quality ranging all over the place. In this video, I'm visiting 9, 10, and 11, so hopefully the quality picks back up again. I've heard some mixed reviews to say the least. But at this point, you know the drill. Let's dig this up. The Land Before Time 9 Journey to Big Water was released in 2002 and like many of the previous sequels had Charles Grosvenor at the helm. This is the first entry into the series that I've honestly never seen before so I had no idea what to expect. Could it be possible that nostalgia was the true culprit of my enjoyment? Maybe The Stone of Cold Fire wasn't a masterclass of modern literature after all. Whether I had nostalgia goggles or not, I can certainly say that Journey to Big Water exists. This surely is one of the movies of all time. <sighs> it's not that I hated this one, heck, I don't even dislike it. It just kinda is. Not much happens here. Where I said 5 perfected the formula and utilized it well, 9 feels overly formulaic without adding anything interesting. It's a Land Before Time film, on autopilot really. Nothing that creative goes on. Okay, we get a main character who's fully aquatic. Eh, we've seen marine reptiles before. What else? Uh, a swimming sharp tooth. Neoplorodon is a new and fun addition, but we've had threats from the water before. You need to sell me on more than that. I mean, it's alright, like... Overrated as f So, what's the story about then? Well, after some torrential downpours, the Great Valley and its surroundings have flooded, looking like a Fortnite Chapter 2 map. Afterwards, Littlefoot can't find anyone to play with. The movie literally starts with our characters being bored. Spoiler alert, watching bored characters doesn't make me any less bored. But then the flooding brings a new character, this ophthalmosaurus named Mo, to the valley, played by Rob Paulson, who I guess needed an easy paycheck. The only surprise in this whole movie was calling him Mo. From the moment I saw the cover, I would have sworn he would be Opie the Ophthalmosaurus. Then if he were played by Ron Howard, I would have felt a nostalgia rush, but I guess not. Mo makes friends with Littlefoot, wanting his guidance back home to the ocean. It doesn't help that he's also living with a Leoplorodon. Though the others think this is a dumb idea, the ichthyosaur has plot contrivances on his side as an earthquake separates them all from the rest of the Great Valley. Since the group has no choice, they accompany him on his trip. Ah, oh, sh**. Here we go again. Just a quick side note. Um, yeah, don't do this. Don't plot contrivance or convenience your characters around. This robs them of any agency and decision-making abilities, subtracting from their character. You want proactive protagonists who have agency in their own lives, not ragdolls being flung from one place to the other. Unless your character's arc specifically involves learning to have agency in their own lives, like say, holes, don't try it. And that's about it. Everyone walks Mo back home. They briefly meet a Diplodocus mother and her eggs. A fight ensues with the sharp tooth, and then they make it to the ocean. Basically, they walk to the ocean and back. The end. Alright, alright, it's not like there's zero creativity here, but nothing is done with it. Mo loves joking and playing around constantly, acting like a drugged up dolphin. At one point, he even pretends to get stuck, causing the crew to panic, nearly drowning themselves trying to save him. I thought we were headed towards an interesting cat in the hat like lesson. Like, yeah, games are fun, but can go way too far. Rather than getting fed up with Mo or putting him in his place, they're grumpy for a few seconds, then totally forget it ever happened. I guess there is this ongoing threat of, you don't have to be bored or lonely cause there's life everywhere, but it feels tacked on, like, yeah, thanks. Next time I'm bored, I'll go stare at some grass. Thank you very much for that. Please, just give me something to latch onto. Anything. Each of the songs are fine. No one has to be alone is clearly meant to be the standout, but it pales in comparison to some previous songs in the series. We are given a fun reprise of Big Water, a better song from a better movie, though it's nice to see some continuity and awareness of what came before. 
Also like Mysterious Island, Littlefoot's mom is mentioned again, but fleetingly, without any of the feels we had before. And I guess that's all I have to say about Journey to Big Water. It exists. Everyone came back to get paid, and then left. Any interesting themes or ideas were left somewhere on the cutting room floor. Again, not bad, not terrible, but not good either. Nine is largely inoffensive child entertainment that could have done a lot more with what it had. For that reason, I'll stick it between 6 and 8. After two mediocre installments in a row, I've been questioning whether the franchise still has some juice left, or if it's all downhill from here. Am I doomed to a life of five more bland installments? Now we're at 2003's The Land Before Time 10, The Great Long Neck Migration. Or is it called The Great Migration? It can't seem to make up its mind. I heard good things about this one, and now... Going in blind with no nostalgia goggles, I'm heavily inclined to agree. This entry revitalized my interest in the series. All sparks of creativity have not died out. The Great Long Neck Migration takes us to new, exciting, and heartwarming places. I wish I had seen this one ages ago. Instantly, the inciting incident has more mystery, more intrigue than anything in the previous installment. Littlefoot and his grandparents keep having visions about the sun, feeling their instincts pulling them towards something. Driven by this urge to go explore, they head out into the unknown. <laughs> Alright, sorry for that one. Somehow, Frozen 2 managed to be worse than the original. Anyways, the rest of the friends sneak out on their own subplot to join Littlefoot and are helped along the way by Pat. The Apatosaurus. Get it? Littlefoot's family, too, are helped by a super source named, wouldn't you believe it, Sue. Get it? Get it? Thank god there aren't any Repetosaurus around. I don't have much to say on these side characters, except Sue's 100% the type of girl who needs guys to be 6 feet or else. Or 60 feet in this instance. Once she finds tall guys, well... They only hunt in twos and threes. <laughs> Your friend Sue could handle that many herself. Damn! So Littlefoot makes it to a giant sauropod infested crater, where, serious spoiler alert, please click away if you don't want this spoiled, he meets his long lost father, Braun, played by the guy from 24. 24. <laughs> Man, I wish I didn't already know that going in. It would have been an amazing twist. But you can't touch this fandom with a 10 foot pole without hearing about it. Bronze inclusion could have easily gone wrong with poor delivery or a poor excuse for why he wasn't around. The line to get milk was very, very long. Thankfully, it's all managed tastefully enough. I'm satisfied with the answers given. Littlefoot's parents were separated in an earth shake, which, yeah, all the liable contrivance. But afterwards, he searched and searched until he stumbled upon some orphans to take care of. From there, he eventually formed his own herd. Yeah, it's contrived, but it's about as good as an explanation you can ask for. One of the lost boys is this Brachiosaurus looking dude, Shorty, who's already the bully archetype, but grows jealous of Littlefoot when Bronn starts showing him more attention. And for real though, he doesn't even glance at Shorty once Littlefoot's in the picture. He's clearly playing favorites. It's simple, it's straightforward, but it's something. A natural conflict between characters that we can easily understand. My mind isn't blown, but at least the writers added some flavor to this script. Something that was clearly lacking the last time. Not gonna lie, I ended up emotionally invested in this one. So, all the characters reunite, they fight some sharp teeth, and then we get to the big event. We get the reveal that the big mystery is a lunar eclipse. Though the long neck stink the sun is falling out of the sky or some nonsense. Instinctually, they all stretch their necks to raise up the sun and save the world. I enjoyed the little mystery. There was some build up with a fun payoff, so I'm here for it. Once everything is said and done, Littlefoot must decide whether he wants to stay with Bronn or return home with his grandparents and friends. It's a well crafted choice with no wrong answer, and it's made by our protagonist alone. No convenience, or contrivance, or out-of-pocket revelation makes the decision for him allowing for nice drama. 
This is exactly what I'm talking about. Us audiences see so much more into Littlefoot's character through actions he chooses to make rather than the plot making them for him. I would have been happy either way. The series could have ended on 10 with him choosing to stay with his father, but he chose to take care of his grandparents who are climbing up there in age. Remember, by this point, if it weren't for Littlefoot, Grandpa Longneck would have been long gone already. He's been a great help to his grandparents and the Great Valley and embraces his responsibility. Awesome. So much better than, uh, Earthshake happened so I have no choice. I know this is a 20 year old movie made for elementary schoolers, but I was hooked. If I had to give one tiny nitpick though, there are a few moments of speech 100, like one character will be feeling something, but there's not enough time to organically resolve the issue, so a few lines of dialogue totally 180 the character. I get it, we have less than 80 minutes of screen time, we have to move along, move along like I know you do, but these moments stand out. Anyways, The Land Before Time 10, The Great Long Neck Migration, proves that even this far in, there are still some fumes of creativity left. It's still possible to find new and innovative stories. 10 is in the same field as 1 for me. Uh, it, it can just go under the original. After a surprising victory this late into the game, we've now reached The Land Before Time 11, Invasion of the Tiny Sources from 2005. One of the most vile movies of the series from what I hear. I do remember my mom picking this up from the store for me one day in elementary school, but I don't recall ever watching it, and no memories flooded back to my mind seeing it now, so I'd say this is also a first for me. Sorry mom that you wasted your money, I'll give you $5 back. Seeing it for presumably the first time, along with high heaps of criticism, I expected an unmitigated disaster of animation, something on par with say, Norm of the North, or Shark Tale. Are you not entertained? Alaska Link! You can't handle the truth! In my opinion, yeah, it was pretty bad, but not that bad. The quality control of these films is decent, even when there's a flop every now and then. It's never downright horrible. Tiny Sources falls into that same feeling I had with Six, Source Rock where I had to question if there's enough content here to fill the already short runtime of 80 minutes. It just feels like the plot could have been accomplished more efficiently in an episode of a TV show. Though unlike the earlier entry that had some genuinely great parts, this one is a total nothing burger of a movie that switches between two modes, mediocre and dull, or straight up stupid. I can't think of any redeeming quality that will bring me back around for another viewing. So what story is stretched to fill the runtime? Well, it's becoming that time when a special tree begins blooming extra tasty flowers that everybody and their mothers in the Great Valley wants, but they each have to wait until the allotted nibbling day to get their share. Because we have to have some sort of plot, Littlefoot attempts eating the flowers before the right time and somehow destroys the entire tree. Somehow. Thank god these are the most fragile flowers known to man or else we may not have had a movie. Once conscious again, he notices a bunch of tiny long necks eating all the flowers, then blames these tiny sources for the devastation. How did sauropods get so tiny? Don't know, don't care. We don't have time for such obvious questions. Yeah, um, The Land Before Time has always been inaccurate, of course, stuck with many outdated portrayals, and of course, anthropomorphic talking dinosaurs. But Universal may have jumped the shark here. Tiny sauropods. For no explicable reason. The grown-ups, led by Sarah's dad, go on a manhunt for the tiny sauruses, while Littlefoot finds them and befriends their whole society, including their leader, Big Daddy. No, that would have been cool, something this movie doesn't do. Instead, we're introduced to this monstrosity. What is this? What am I even looking at? It's a tiny source with the chin of a Giganotosaurus. 
And not like a proportionally sized Giganotosaurus chin. No, they took the chin from a 13 meter theropod and just shoved it on a one foot sauropod. I would call this easily the worst character design in Eleven, but that title surprisingly goes to another character I'll discuss soon. More filler passes until the adults find their lair and attempt to straight up genocide them until Littlefoot confesses that he ruined the flowers. Yeah, sure. I get that this is supposed to be his moment of truth, literally, but like, did he really though? Sure, he knocked them off the tree, but the tiny sources still devoured all of them. If you're gonna have yet another story about a liar telling the truth, at least make the truth part of the actual truth. That way we still get some satisfaction. Here I was left scratching my head. It's still those tiny jerks fault. Drop that rock and end them now. Do it. Alright, of course this is a huge overreaction, even for Mr. Threehorn, murdering a whole society because they stole your snacks, and your snack snack, but we'll get there. But the tiny sources also did no favors for themselves, acting like total morons. In many previous entries, newcomers had arrived in the Great Valley. Apart from Mr. Threehorn, they're always welcome with open arms, then allowed to graze at their heart's content. Even a herd of obese stegosaurus, who are known for their large appetites, are more than welcomed. Why didn't the tiny sauruses do that? If they needed a place to stay and eat, why not go through the front entrance, make your presence known, and ask to stay for a while? You're small, you don't even eat much, so why would anyone mind? Boom, all of your problems are solved. Rather than being logical, what is their plan? To sneak into the valley underground, then steal everyone's food when they're not looking? Of course this will cause resentment. But no, Big Daddy or any others can't see that. Instead of taking accountability for their own actions, they adopt a victim mentality, putting all the blame on the biases of others. Biases that wouldn't exist if they didn't start stealing. Oh, boo-hoo, we're small and they're big, so they'll never accept us. Bruh, no one knew you even existed a few days ago until you ate their flowers. Hmm, let's see. Take responsibility for my own life or blame you. Ding, 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 ding. Ugh. Anyways, let's continue. While all this nonsense is going on, we get a subplot with Sarah's dad reuniting with an old flame of his, Tria. Sarah doesn't take it well, driving a wedge between her and her father. I have a lot to unpack here. First of all, Again, what the heck happened to Sarah's family? We know she has siblings. We've seen her mother before. What in Shrek's name happened to them? It's never explained in previous sequels, with everyone else dismissed in one-off lines by Mr. Threehorn about only having Sarah. But we're also introduced to Dinah and Dana, her niece and nephew. So are there other family members or not? Did the mom go Karen mode leaving with most of the kids? Is Mr. Threehorn taking on a side piece in full view of everyone? That's my headcanon interpretation, because it makes it so hilarious how supportive each character is except Sarah. Or less funny it would be that her mother passed away at some point, which would have been such an interesting story to explore, maybe explaining why Mr. Threehorn is so protective because he doesn't want to lose someone again, but no. None of these options are explored, it's all skipped so we can jump straight to the romance part. Building compelling characters is hard, that takes actual writing and effort, who does that? Second, somehow nobody manages to be sympathetic in this situation. Like I want to punch them each in the face. Sarah's being a little brat who straight up doesn't want her dad to be happy. But I want things back the way they were before, when you didn't like anybody and nobody liked you. Oh, hi Bluey. Why is she acting like this? Who knows? We get next to zero family history here that might justify her behavior. But just when you feel bad for Mr. Threehorn, him and Tria verbally curb stomp Sarah, not caring how she feels because they like each other and she's just being a brat. Shut up, bitch! True, she's been a bumhole, but if she's your whole world, as you keep claiming, then shouldn't her opinion matter too? Shouldn't you make sure she's comfortable with such a drastic life change? Okay, and third, holy crap, what is Shria's design? This, this right here is the worst character design I've seen so far in these films. I can just imagine the creators working on this. You know what, kids might not pick up that the flirtatious, female-sounding Triceratops is female. Let's make her bright pink. 
Mm, okay, yes, yes, genius. Oh, and, and if they still can't figure it out, how about we give Tria eyelashes? But uh, other characters already have eyelashes, even though they're male. No, 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 not real eyelashes, an eyelash pattern on the scales around her eyes. Genius. Man, oh, what were they thinking? On a practical note, how is Tria supposed to survive as an infant? Well, most other creatures are earthy, realistic colors that can help them camouflage. She's pink! Sharp Toots will see her a mile away. Natural selection, do your thing. To close out this installment, the tiny sauruses try to leave the Great Valley until they're attacked by what I read are supposed to be Utah Raptors. Even though they only have two claws on each hand, which is weird, are these Raptor T-Rex hybrids? Well, either way, the Utahs make their way into the Great Valley, cause some trouble until everyone bands together to fight them off. Due to their help, the members of the Great Valley welcome the tiny sauruses, and everyone lives happily ever after, especially Mr. Threehorn, who gets the topsy sloppy. After first seeing it, I didn't think Eleven was that bad, instead being mediocre and forgettable. But the more I thought about it, and wrote about it, the more my disdain grew. It wasn't so awful that the series has no hope going forward, and I never want to see another adventure with the gang again, but still a contender for the worst. <sighs> I could see this going either way, worst or second worst. 4 is far more painful to watch at points, but has some redeeming qualities, like a phenomenal setup. 11 doesn't ever go that low or for that long, though fails to have any redeeming qualities. There's no reason for me to ever come back and watch this. Possibly a controversial take here, but due to being less painful, I'm ranking 11 over 4 still. Like, if I were ever kidnapped and tortured for information, I would much rather that my torturers put on 11 than 4. So I'm gonna go with 11 over 4. Not the worst, just very, very close. That's 11 down, now with only 3 more to go. Even if Tiny Sauruses was bad, it wasn't so bad that the series can't possibly recover. Hopefully, we get a decent comeback with some of the others I haven't seen. Next time, next time we finish this. Remember, if you enjoyed this episode, to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you then.